This is part two of our videos on ground rent. If you haven't watched part one, we suggest that you watch that one first. The link is in the description. In the first video, we covered how almost all productivity is at the end of the day captured by landowners instead of workers. That is definitely a very unfair system, but could there be even worse problems for the community to deal with? This video will follow up on that topic by covering the extensive damage land speculation causes to local communities. To begin with, consider another patch of free land, just like the colony from part 1. This time the settlement establishes a government body to assign and enforce land titles. Titles are easy to get. You just need to go down to the office and pay a nominal administrative fee. Pioneers head for the new territory and begin claiming land. Land is plentiful, so settlers are allowed to choose how much to take and there is no cost to hold the land in your name. Just as before, Prime Land pays $4 in wages if you work it with your bare hands and no one will accept wages lower than $4 because you have to pay at least as much as someone would get working for themselves, wages are set by the productivity of the lowest grade land in use. As long as there is enough of the best grade for everyone and nobody has to accept land of lower grade, then 100% of the return from production count as going to labor and we can say that land has no economic rent. Land started off free and plentiful, but what happens when increased settlement changes people's perception? Even though there is as yet no value to land, some early settlers begin to fence off more than they can use in anticipation of impending scarcity. They are speculating that the value of land will soon rise. Since there is no cost to holding land, even if you cannot or will not use it, Land titles make claiming and excluding others easy. Everyone knows the first rule of economics is to buy low and sell high. And there is no price lower than free. When more settlers arrive, the land held out of use by the early speculators forces some of the newcomers to accept second grade land. What happens to the economy when people are forced to accept lower grade land? Wages fall and economic rent goes up by $1 on prime lots, which is the difference between the returns received working on second grade and first grade land. Even if the settlers on first grade lots are still working the land themselves, the land itself now has a value due to scarcity and someone may be willing to pay for that value. So economically we can say that a portion of their return are going to land. How do other members of the community react to this? Learning from the early speculators behavior, some of the new settlers also grab more land than they can work. We now have a land rush. Notice that the two lots of prime land held by speculators from the previous year actually lower overall production by $2 beyond what would be the case had they been granted to the first settler willing to work them. More settlers and speculators come. Thanks to the land held out of production, the lowest grade land that still pays a sustaining wage is opened a year earlier than in the previous colony where land was claimed only to be worked. At the same population level, that colony still had third grade land available and wages of $2. So laborers are poorer, but how are the landowners doing? The landowners are surprisingly doing fine. A clever one might even have held some land out of production, knowing it would make the rest of his holdings more valuable and his workforce cheaper. The return to land is almost double that of labor. Even though production is lower than the first colony, rent is actually higher. What happens when all workable land is claimed? Notice that over the past three years, Speculation has actually made the colony poorer. It has lowered wages, 
reduced total production of wealth and eliminated jobs. Meanwhile, prospective immigrants have no possibility of employment, even though there is unworked land that they could use. With little prospects and no free land, few immigrants are interested, so growth in the value of land slows. Speculators start putting their land up for sale to reap the rewards generated by their fellow citizens' industry and pioneering spirit. When economists talk about investments, they often like to talk about a rate called the capitalization rate. This rate can be calculated as follows. Capitalization rate equals income divided by market value. The formula states that if you consider a piece of land worth, for example, $1 million, which generates an income of $100,000, then the owner is able to capitalize on $100,000 divided by 1 million equals 10% of the land's value. So in this case, the capitalization rate is 10%. So why do we care about the capitalization rate? Well, the convenience of this formula is that we can use it to calculate how much money each piece of land is worth. In order to do so, we rewrite the equation as follows. Market value equals income divided by capitalization rate. Thus, in order for us to calculate how much a piece of land is worth, we only need to know the income and capitalization rate associated with the land. We already know what the income is, and for convenience, we assume that the capitalization rate is 10%, because other assets can perform with a 10% yearly return. If we then consider a prime grade lot, then a speculator could sell this piece of land for $3 divided by 10% equals $30. So now we know what the market value is, but we are not completely done yet because sometimes speculators might also charge a speculative premium in addition to the market value. In this case, the formula changes to this. Market value equals income divided by capitalization rate plus speculative premium. Now, what do we mean by speculative premium? When considering the value of land, one can assume that the value will increase over time and therefore they can add to the price because they believe the value will go up in the future. For example, one of the speculators owning a prime grade land might decide that $30 is not enough and therefore he might add a speculative premium of for example $4 on top of the price. And in this case the price of his land would change from $30 to $34. Notice that because all land is claimed, even this plot with no economic rent, can command a nominal speculatory price. The price that the speculators are demanding is very high. So how does the colony react? They are desperate to put the idle lands to use, in order to create more jobs and wealth. But it will take quite some time to come up with the ransom that the speculators demand. The six idle lots have a combined asking price of $110. This can only come from the sweat and toil of all members of the community. The entire colony only produces $25 a year in surplus, so land will change hands very slowly. Speculators can afford to wait because land, unlike other investments, do not wear out. They do not have maintenance or holding costs and the burden of enforcing their exclusive rights and ejecting squatters are borne by the public. So how and when can land change hands? When land does change hands, it will tend to go to other landowners who actually have disposable income and savings. Wages are such that laborers will never be able to afford to purchase land outright. If an early colonist claimed prime land and saved $3 out of her $4 wages every year, she would have enough to purchase another lot of idle first grade land after 10 or 11 years. By taking the money, the speculator has, like a parasite, siphoned 
all the ground rent that the community generated from the land over 10 years. In doing so, he expended no effort, contributed nothing to the community, prevented employment and depressed production. Just like in the previous episode, the tool pedaling boat comes down the river. How will the increased productivity affect the colony this time? Speculators will profit from any increase in productivity that finds its way into ground rent. When the tool pedaling boat from the colony in part 1 arrives, land values incorporate the resulting rise in production wages and rent. Wealth has increased due to the free and undirected enterprise of workers and entrepreneurs intersecting with the uncreated potential of nature. Land speculators do not take part in this process, but they still collect their portion. Redeeming the idle land will take many years of grinding work. In the meantime, how will the colony fare? Inequality will tend to widen, because only those already possessing land will be able to afford more. Wages are still set by the lowest grade of land that is free, and after all land is put into production, they will be set to the minimum that workers will accept. Speculators also have the option of taking their gains and reinvesting in more land, letting it lie idle as well. If they are patient, they need never suffer through an honest day's work again, and the cycle will be set to continue. It may seem puzzling that speculators leave land idle while waiting for a buyer. Shouldn't they at least rent it out so that they could make even more money? They could do that, but it would require management, effort and risk, even if just a little. Land speculation is about optimizing returns for the least amount of effort and letting others generate the wealth. Those who have figured out how the game works would rather spend their time acquiring more land than managing what they have. There are often tax considerations and legal issues that come with actively managing properties that land speculators would rather not deal with. We'll learn more about those later. Let's sum up the development by asking, how much has land speculation hurt the colony? We know that the lots held out of production reduced wages, which gives laborers less disposable income. The overall production of the colony was reduced, which causes a reduction in supply of goods. And unemployment was higher because less jobs were available. These three factors are some of the worst things that people can experience. Think about how much people suffer during economic crises and downturns, or when they simply can't afford a good lifestyle. But not only has the colony endured these massive productivity losses, all the leftover productivity from the colony must now be used to purchase the empty land back from the speculators, thereby siphoning the money away from the people. If we assume that each buyer saved up for 10 years to buy each idle lot, it would take 16 years before all land was purchased. The savings come out of the wages and rent of productive colonists, but are captured by non-productive owners of land. When captured wages are included with foregone production from idle lands, the results can be striking. Over the 16 year cycle, the amount lost to speculators is 42% of the total realized production in the colony. This from only 8 lots out of 30. This is the end of part 2 in our series on ground rent. We are working hard to spread the message of Georgism so that we can fix the broken tax system which desensitizes productivity and makes housing unaffordable. If this is something that you care about, then please help us out, spread the message and like the video so we can reach more people and make a real difference.